Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. I'm pleased to welcome in the studio Portugal's Foreign Minister, Joel Gomes Cravinho. As you can imagine, he has a pretty distinguished and long CV, which I can't mention entirely, so I'll just pick out a few of his previous roles. Minister of National Defence, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and Cooperation, and European Union Ambassador to Brazil and to India. Foreign Minister, welcome to France 24. Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. So let's start with uh, Ukraine, but I want to get to that through uh, a recent visit uh, by the president of Brazil, President Lula, to Portugal, where he very publicly stated that there should be negotiations to end the war. Uh, and he's asking for a kind of third way, a negotiated settlement. Is this a diplomatic headache for you? Oh, not at all. Not at all. We shouldn't be surprised that Brazil has a foreign policy which is different from the foreign policy of European countries. It's, uh, after all, a completely different geopolitical context, a different experience. Brazil is a country that has not had war on its borders for 150 years. And so, uh, and on the other hand, Brazil is also a country that engages closely with, with Russia, with uh, India, China, South Africa, in the BRICS context. So it's normal that it should have an approach that is different. What is very valuable, though, is to be able to engage closely with uh, Lula. And we've had uh, very uh, close relations uh, since, he was, uh, since he was elected, and of course, well before going back, stretching back well before then. So and it, this it allows us for, for uh, uh, I think, a, a useful exchange about the role that each and play. And speaking of that, those different roles, would you be okay with Brazil uh, leading or being part of a non-aligned movement that actually leads negotiations if the West doesn't want to do that? Well, uh, unfortunately, this, are not, uh, mom this is not a moment where we could be uh, uh, optimistic about any kind of negotiations taking place. I think that uh, it is important that countries such as Brazil, uh, such as China, such as India, that have an ongoing dialogue with Russia, uh, engage with Russia in order to explain that Russia is going to have to find a way out of the mess that it has created. This, is, uh, this was very much a part of our conversation with President Lula in Portugal. And uh, uh, I think that there is a, a concern that, is, that some countries have that it's necessary to find some kind of mechanism that helps Russia out. Our view is that uh, as Europeans, what we have to be doing is supporting Ukraine uh, in order to demonstrate very clearly that if Russia doesn't find this solution for itself, it will face uh, defeat on the battlefield. So uh, recently, uh, the head of NATO said that Ukraine's place is in the Atlantic Alliance on a visit to Kiev. Portugal is a founding member of NATO. Uh, do you agree with that or are you more skeptical about Ukraine actually joining? I think we, we all have a, a joint commitment to the open door policy. In 2008, there was a deep discussion about whether Ukraine should join. Back then, the predominant idea was that uh, Ukraine joining NATO would be seen as a provocation to Russia. Of course, that idea uh, has now been rendered, uh, it, it's overtaken by, by events, and namely by Russia's invasion. So there's a completely different scenario. I don't think anybody is looking at the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO while there was a war going on. After the war, it's a question that we should all be, uh, be deliberating because, on. Because, I mean, if you imagine Ukraine being in NATO and invoking it would have invoked Article 5, for example, last February, if it had already been in NATO, which would have meant Portuguese troops fighting in Ukraine, potentially. I mean, that's the yeah. bottom line. Well, one can look at it differently. If Ukraine had been in NATO, then probably it wouldn't have been invaded, exactly because there is an Article 5 in NATO. There's different ways of looking at it. Uh, I want to ask you about um, the EU's relations with China, and actually Portugal's relations with, with China uh, first. Um, you've given a positive assessment of the one country, two systems policy for Macau, which for our viewers, I should say, was a Portuguese territory, but came under uh, Chinese control more than 20 years ago. Um, so you're pretty positive about how things are going in Macau since the transfer of power to China, and this despite numerous human rights reports about, about the problems there. 
Well, we've just actually had a visit a few days ago of the uh, chief executive of Macau, and uh, it was a very interesting visit. It allows us to go into some depth about uh, the agreement that was established in 1999 when uh, Macau was transferred back to Chinese sovereignty, and, uh, cre and there was the creation of the the basic law, which uh, runs for 50 years, which means that Portuguese law applies in Macau uh, for that period of time, and, and it can be renewed afterwards. Um, it, you know, we're not 100% satisfied, mm. but we globally uh, believe that it has made a very important contribution to Macau being what it is. So I'm sure you're aware of the State Department, uh, the US State Department's Human Rights Report for Macau in 2022, which mentions significant human rights issues, including credible reports of serious restrictions of journalists, freedom and substantial interference with the right of uh, peaceful assembly. What, what, what do you think about that? Well, these are matters that we have been able to discuss with the authorities in Macau. I, I think that one has to look at the global picture. One has mm. to look at overall what is happening in Macau, uh, what is the reality of China, and whether we do, in fact, in effect, have uh, one country and two systems. And I think that uh, it's quite clear that uh, Macau has benefited enormously from uh, this basic law, from being part of a different type of uh, system within the context of Chinese sovereignty. And uh, we're working with, uh, the Chinese, with the authorities in China and in Macau with respect to uh, issues, specific issues that uh, there have been problems. But you've got a real balancing act, haven't you? Because at the same time as uh, you obviously want to have a smooth relationship with China because of Macau. The vice president of Taiwan has said that he wants to deepen relations with Portugal. And recently there was a visit by members of the Portuguese parliament to Taiwan. Um, can, can you really balance those two things out or do you have to sort of choose to, you know, stop at a certain point with deepening relations with Taiwan? The Portuguese uh, parliamentarians who visited uh, Taiwan did so as individuals, so they were not emissaries, okay. certainly not of the government, of course, certainly not of the Portuguese state, they were not even emissaries, emissaries of, the, of the parliament itself, because they went on an unofficial capacity. Um, having uh, said that, uh, we uh, are perfectly satisfied with the current status. Mm. We support the current status. We, of course, also uh, believe that, uh, that China, uh, believe in the one China policy and uh, and have no have no second uh, no ambiguities with respect so, to that. so I assume when uh, Joseph Borrell the EU foreign policy chief said uh, as he did recently in the journal du dimanche European countries should think about sending more ships to the Straits of Taiwan you don't agree with that I'm guessing well, unfortunately, we don't have an infinite amount of ships. We uh, tend to focus on the areas where we think we have value added, which is particularly down uh, the west coast of Africa and the Mediterranean and the North Atlantic. And so uh, and that that is going to be the, the priority for Portugal in the next uh, next foreseeable years. Let's come back to Portugal and Europe. Uh, the European Commission has decided to refer you and some other EU countries to the Court of Justice of the European Union for not transposing the EU's Renewable Energy Directive into national legislation. Maybe you can just clear this issue up for, uh, for us, because actually your renewables performance, according to the OECD, is above the average for the OECD. No, absolutely. It's not only above the average. We, we are really a leading nation in terms of renewable energies. And I think above all, that's what counts rather than more technical, legal aspects related to transposition of directives. Um, we have over 60 percent of our electricity coming from renewable sources. We have the ambition of reaching 80 percent in 2026. So uh, uh, we're very pleased with the way we're going in terms of uh, renewables, and it has allowed Portugal to be a, a leading example and also to uh, engage with other parts of the world, with South America, with Africa, uh, in, uh, in charting a new green uh, future for us. So, so you're confident that there won't be a, this won't end up with sanctions or, or financial penalties as a result of the action that's being taken by the European Commission? You know, we, we have a, a very uh, intricate uh, engagement uh, at the European level with rules that uh, take place at the, at the European level, at the national level. Mm. And uh, so such, uh, such kind of um, uh, situations are fairly 
frequent. Uh, this is not a matter that is going to deviate us at all from what is our very um, strong policy in terms of promoting renewables in, in Portugal and being at the forefront of the European debate about that. Your government uh, is ending the so-called golden visas scheme, which uh, allows or has allowed foreigners to buy property in, in Portugal. W why? W what is the purpose of, of ending this? And, and is it going to destroy tourism, as some associations have claimed? No, absolutely not. We're very uh, comfortable with the actually extraordinary tourist numbers and uh, uh, we think that 2023 is going to be a record-breaking uh, year in this respect. The reason is very simple. We went through a profound financial crisis in 10-12 uh, uh, years ago and the uh, Golden Visa scheme was very helpful in creating uh, new mechanisms for attracting uh, overseas investment. We don't need that anymore. We want uh, investment in other areas, not in the uh, in the real estate uh, uh, area, which is in fact uh, already excessively inflated in Portugal. And so uh, it is simply a question of adjusting uh, our policies. So it's about inflation our, really more than anything it's else. About, uh, it's about inflation. It's simply also about adjusting our policies to what are our current investment needs. Yeah. And um, investing in the real estate market in, in Portugal, attracting investment to that area is not is not a priority. On the contrary, uh, we're happy to see investment go to other areas. Let's finish on that note. And thank you so much for being my guest, Joao Gomes Cravinho, Foreign Minister of Portugal. And that's all for part one of the show. But we'll be talking about some of those China-related issues that you heard us discuss in part two of the programme with my panel of MEPs at the European Parliament. So do stay with us.